In this lecture, we're going to talk about photosynthesis, and it's my goal to shorten up the length of this lecture. It's about 55 minutes uh, previous years. I have cut out a lot of extra information that I felt I included in the past lectures and really just try to simplify the process of photosynthesis for you. You need to know that the reason why plants are performing photosynthesis is they're trying to take the CO2 and convert it into sugars. So we're going to say that during photosynthesis, plants are reducing CO2, or another way to say that is they're fixing CO2 to produce organic molecules like sugars. Ultimately, we're going to see inside the chloroplast, we're going to see this occur. We're going to see that water is going to get split, and these protons and electrons are going to be transferred to CO2. So we're going to say that CO2 is going to be reduced. So let's show the movement of protons and electrons from water to CO2. And if you add hydrogen to carbon and oxygen, then you have organic molecules. You have molecules that contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So we're going to form CO2 into sugars. If you think about it, when we remove the hydrogens off of the water molecule, then that just leaves the oxygen. And so that's why oxygen is formed. I think you're going to think that photosynthesis is more simple than respiration. There's only two stages to understand in photosynthesis. The first one is often referred to as the light reaction. And stage two, or the second step, is often referred to as the Calvin cycle. But we're going to see that we can refer to these cycles in different ways. Sometimes, instead of just saying the light reaction, it's called the light-dependent reaction. And sometimes the Calvin cycle is called the light-independent reaction. And sometimes it's even called the dark cycle. But we don't like calling it the dark cycle because it makes students think that the Calvin cycle only happens in the dark. And that's not true. The now, because I feel like you have studied respiration and you understand what takes place inside the mitochondria, we're going to jump right into a chloroplast and into the thylakoids. And we're going to look and see this process of photosynthesis. And you're going to find it's very similar to what takes place inside of the mitochondria. So let's make sure you understand um, some of the parts of this diagram. First of all, what we're looking at is a chloroplast. So that would mean this outside area, this would be the cytoplasm of a plant cell. Now, inside the chloroplast, we have two areas you need to be concerned with. First of all, this fluid-filled region is the stroma. So let's indicate this is the fluid. It's kind of like the cytoplasm of the cell, but it's the fluid of the chloroplast. So we have the stroma, and then we have the thylakoids. Now, the thylakoids look like coins, and this one, this one thylakoid has kind of been blown up so that you can see how it's going to work. But ultimately, you have stacks of thylakoids. So this that you see here is really this, just blown up. This is the inside of the thylakoid. So that would be this area right here, and it's called the lumen of the thylakoid. Now, let's take a look at the membrane of the thylakoid. You're going to see something kind of familiar to the membranes of the mitochondria. Here we have embedded, I'm going to label it very small, an electron transport chain. And as you know, it transports electrons. But it looks like we have um, some other structures here. These two structures that we see here in green, those are called the photosystems. They are a cluster of pigments, because you know that pigna pigments, like chlorophyll, absorb light. Well, here's the cluster of chlorophyll molecules and other pigments, which we'll talk about more later. And those are concentrated in what's called the photosystems. So let's indicate that these are the photosystems. And this photosystem is called photosystem 2. Now, we're going to start this process with photosystem 2. So it's kind of odd that it's named 2 instead of 1. But it was discovered second. So that's why it's referred to as photosystem 2. And then eventually, we're going to talk about this one over here. And this is photosystem 1. So that's photosystem 1. And let's note that photosystems are a collection of 
pigment. So these little circles that you see right here, those are pigments like chlorophyll. Let's start with light. Light is going to strike the photosystems. That's what you're seeing here. So let's start with photosystem two. Light strikes these pigments. And when the pigments absorb this light energy, it excites their electrons. And that's what we see kind of taking place right here, is that electrons from the pigments get excited. And then these electrons get passed down the electron transport chain. Now, just like with the mitochondria, as electrons are being passed down the electron transport chain, protons are going to be moved. In this case, they're being moved into the thylakoid. And we're getting a high concentration of protons inside the thylakoid. Now, you might see where this is going. If we have a high concentration of protons inside the thylakoid and a lower concentration outside, then protons can flow down the electrochemical gradient or down the concentration gradient, and that provides the energy needed for the thylakoid to make some ATP. Now, you're probably thinking, wait a second, we learned that the mitochondria makes ATP, and now you are showing me that the chloroplast has the ability to make ATP. Let's talk about the difference. Is the ATP made by the mitochondria is going to be used by the other parts of the cell. But the ATP that is made here in the light reaction goes to be used in the Calvin cycle or in the dark reaction. So there's no excess ATP to power the motor proteins in the cytoplasm um, or to phosphorylate kinases or to be turned into cyclic AMP. All of those ATP molecules came from the mitochondria. All of the ATP molecules produced by the chloroplast is going to be used up within the chloroplast. Okay, now, since we made some ATP, let's go ahead and talk about it. What's gonna happen? Over here in the Calvin cycle, or in stage two, we can see that in goes the CO2, and through a series of reactions, we end up making sugar. We are trying to take CO2, add hydrogen atoms to it, we're trying to build a molecule. That is an endergonic reaction. And so it costs energy to organize the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms into a sugar. And that energy is provided by the ATP molecules that were made in the light reaction. Now, we've talked about light in our equation for photosynthesis. Let's go ahead and dress the water, the input of water. We can see water molecules right here. Now, if you think about it, if these pigments are always losing electrons, and those electrons are getting passed down the electron transport chain, those pigments would run out of electrons. Here comes water to save the day. Water is our constant source of electrons. So I wanna show you that water gets split. And we'll talk about more how water's getting split. And so the electrons are used to replace the electrons that are getting lost from those pigment molecules as the electrons are getting passed down the electron transport chain. So we are releasing electrons. We're also producing some protons here. But what we're left with is oxygen. And so the splitting of water leads to the making of oxygen. So we've addressed how water is used in photosynthesis and where the oxygen comes from. So again, to replace the electrons lost from the chlorophyll molecules, when those electrons are passed down the electron transport chain, we use the splitting of water. Water donates the electrons that are going to be passed down the electron transport chain. Now let's continue on with these electrons. So as the electrons get passed down the electron transport chain, these protons are being brought in, and they can be used to synthesize ATP. But let's follow this path, path of electrons. We can see that these electrons are eventually making their way to photosystem one. Here, light can excite these electrons again. And note what happens. They're passed down, down another electron transport chain, so we can put an ETC. But if you remember, the electrons get stuck on that last protein. And in respiration, oxygen was the final electron acceptor.
Well, we have a different final electron acceptor. And this is the coenzyme that's going to seem kind of similar to those NAD plus molecules and those FAD plus molecules. So we have a coenzyme called NADP plus. I like to think of that P as being like the NAD of photosynthesis. And it is going to be reduced. So let's write NADP plus is being reduced. It's going to get this electron and bind to protons that originally came from the, the splicing of water over here. And now we have a molecule called NADPH. This is like the bus. This is the shuttle. And just like the FADH2 and the NADH molecules carried protons and electrons to the electron transport chain, the NADPH is going to shuttle protons and electrons to the Calvin cycle so that we now have these H's to reduce CO2 to form sugars. So to really simplify this, I want you to think of as the CO2 enters the Calvin cycle, so think of here's CO2 molecules, we are reducing CO2, we're adding H's, and that is forming organic molecules, organic sugars with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And that's basically it. So we've addressed that in the Calvin cycle, the CO2 is going to get reduced to form a sugar. And you can see that sugar being produced right here by the Calvin cycle. So I know that that was a lot, but I have it summarized here for you. And let's just kind of go through and again, just summarize what's happening in these two steps. Again, we can call that first step of photosynthesis the light reaction, or sometimes it's called the light dependent reaction. Because you have to have the light to excite the electrons so that they can get passed down the electron transport chain. And again, that second step is called the Calvin cycle, named after the scientist that discovered that this was taking place in the chloroplast, in the stroma of the chloroplast. Sometimes this is called the dark reaction, but we don't see it referred as much now as a dark reaction, because I think that we've, we figured out that um, students think that just the Calvin cycle happens in the dark when there's no light. And that's not exactly true. It's just the Calvin cycle can happen without light. As long as there's a bunch of ATP built up in the chloroplast and a bunch of the NADPH, then we can continue to take the CO2 and turn it into sugar. So the dark reaction happens 24-7. But I've seen it referred to now more as the light independent reaction. So again, the Calvin cycle can happen and it's not light directly causing it to occur. Let's start over here with the light reaction. Now I'm going to read through some of these things and if you need to look at the diagram on your paper as we go through this, um, feel free to do that. So we see that the light, rea light reaction takes place in the thylakoid membrane because that's where the photosystems are embedded and those electron transport chain proteins. So the thylakoids look like coins. If you remember I said, um, think of a thylakoid as being a coin. Sometimes I'll say the thylakoids to help you remember that the thylakoid is just one of those little circles um, in the stack. And when we look at a chloroplast, lots of times we'll see these stacks of coins. The stack is called the granite, but one coin is called the thylakoid. The thylakoid membrane contains those photosystems, um, two and one, and those electron transport chain proteins. Light excites electrons. So you see that the pigments are going to lose electrons, and those electrons are going to go down the electron transport chain. As the electrons are moved down the electron transport chain, we see those H plus ions are moved into the thylakoid, and this creates a high concentration of protons. They're going to flow down the electrical chemical gradient through ATP synthase, and that provides energy to phosphorylate ADP. Now, these electrons that are flowing down the electron transport chain, they have to be replenished, and those electrons come from water. The splitting of water releases protons and electrons that can go down the electron transport chain, but it also produces oxygen. So this is the oxygen that is made in that equation for photosynthesis. Eventually the electrons will flow from photosystem two to one, where they're excited, and then they get passed on to the final electron acceptor, which is NAD+. This is a coenzyme, we say it's getting reduced, and after it accepts those protons and electrons, it's gonna go to the Calvin cycle, just like the ATP that's been produced.
So to summarize, you need to know how light is related to the light reaction or to photosynthesis. Also, you need to know how water is utilized in this process. What's the purpose of water in the equation for photosynthesis? Why do we say that oxygen is a product in the equation for photosynthesis? And also, it's incredibly important that you understand these two things. Is ATP is made in the light reaction, and it's going to then go to the stroma where the dark reaction is going to occur. Because we need energy to turn the CO2 into sugars, and we also need hydrogens right here to reduce the CO2 so that we have organic molecules that have hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen in them. So now that we have the ATP and the NADPH made in the light reaction, we say that they're going to go to the Calvin cycle. So let's indicate that. The ATP made in the light reaction is going to go out to the stroma where the Calvin cycle takes place, or the light independent reaction. Same with this NADPH. So let's indicate the NADPH is going to go out to the stroma, and it's going to provide those hydrogen ions to reduce the CO2 to sugar. So let's take a look at what we have summarized over here. So we say that the Calvin cycle happens in the stroma. See, we have the stroma here. So this is happening in the stroma. There's enzymes that do each step of the Calvin cycle. The ATP supplies the energy to reduce, or another way to say that is we're fixing CO2 into organic molecules. We're changing it into organic molecules. So we need energy to do that. That comes from the ATP. We need hydrogens to put onto that CO2 molecules so we can make um, organic molecules that have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So we say that NADPH supplies protons and electrons used to reduce the CO2 to a sugar. Now that we have used the ATP, now it's down to ADP. That's going to get recycled back and rephosphorylated by the light reaction. And remember, we took off the hydrogen atoms, protons and electrons, from that NADPH molecule. And now it's NADP+. Plus. And again, it's going to go back, just like we reuse buses. We're going to reuse those coenzymes. It's going to get reduced again in the light reaction. Okay? Now, one thing I need you to note is that if you're trying to make one glucose molecule, Glucose is C6H12O6. We see these questions a lot, and they're simple, but you have to do a couple of them, otherwise you're going to mess them up. In the Calvin cycle, we're going to need the input of six CO2 molecules. You need six carbon atoms. You need six carbon atoms because your glucose needs six carbon atoms. So you have to use six CO2 molecules to make one molecule of glucose. Now that we've looked through the processes of photosynthesis, we're going to talk about some additional details. And we're going to look at more diagrams showing the light reaction and the dark reaction to review what we just discussed on this first page. When we see diagrams that are like this, you should be able to recognize that we are looking at this process of photosynthesis. We have the thylakoids. Remember, one little coin here is a thylakoid. So you should be able to recognize that you're looking at a chloroplast with the thylakoids inside of it. And we know that the light reactions are going to take place in the thylakoids, whereas in the stroma, that's where the Calvin cycle is going to take place, aka dark reaction, or also known as the light independent reaction. Let's relate the light reaction and the dark reaction to this equation of photosynthesis. Where exactly is the CO2 used? Where exactly is the oxygen produced? And so on. You need to note that the inputs to the light reaction, of course, are going to be light. And then if you remember, electrons are getting excited and leaving those chlorophyll molecules, and they have to be replenished. That's where water comes in. So water is an input to the light reaction. Water gets spliced, and then water is providing protons and electrons, and we have those leftover oxygen molecules. So when you take a deep breath and you breathe in oxygen, ultimately that oxygen came from a plant water. So let's add that the input to light reaction are water and light, and this is where the oxygen is being produced. As for the Calvin cycle, that's where the CO2 comes in. So we say CO2, inorganic CO2, I want to make a point of that. This is an inorganic molecule. Sometimes it throws off students when 
a description for photosynthesis is the conversion of inorganic carbon into organic molecules. So CO2 is an inorganic molecule that's providing carbon atoms. And you need six of them to make a glucose molecule. So the inputs to the Calvin cycle are CO2. And remember, CO2 is going to get reduced. We're going to put protons and electrons on it. So therefore, it is now an organic molecule. So sometimes in this diagram, we will see that it'll say organic molecules are being produced. And the majority of them are sugars. So sometimes it'll show sugars are being produced by the Calvin cycle. So let's add sugars and organic molecules are what's being produced by the Calvin cycle. Let's note these arrows here. We have the cycling of some things uh, from the light reaction to the Calvin cycle. Again, the purpose of the light reaction is, one, to produce some ATP, because it takes energy to reduce CO2 to a sugar. And then to reduce CO2, you need those H's and electrons, those protons and electrons. And those are picked up by NADP plus to make NADPH. And that's going to then bring those protons and electrons to reduce the CO2. After we use those molecules, they're recycled. Now we have ADP plus phosphate or inorganic phosphate that's going to be recycled back. We can make ATP again with it in a light reaction. And those NADP plus molecules, again, are recycled back. They can go pick up more protons and electrons. Again, we're just going through some additional details. I want to talk about some vocabulary words that are often used that sometimes can seem a bit confusing to students. The first one that I want to address is called chemiosmosis. We know that osmosis is the flow of water. When we're talking about chemiosmosis, so again, osmosis is like the flow. It's like the flow of chemicals, not water. And specifically, it's the flow of these hydrogen ions, these protons. We talked about that protons are going to diffuse across the membrane. So let's show you that. As the electrons get excited and pass down the electron transport chain, then we have these protons being pulled into the thylakoid. And that's where we get this high concentration in here. Now, the flow of protons through ATP synthase, okay? The flow of protons is called chemiosmosis. Chemiosmosis, or the flow of protons across the membrane, provides the energy to phosphorylate ATP. So that's what we mean by chemiosmosis. It's just the flow of those protons across the membrane down the concentration gradient. Now, we've talked about that before, and I need you to understand is we saw protons flow in respiration they were coming from the inner membrane back into the matrix. And we can see that there's also a flow of protons, or chemiosmosis is also occurring in photosynthesis. So you need to note that chemiosmosis occurs in both photosynthesis and respiration. Now, another term you might see is this term that's called photophosphorylation. Now, we know that ultimately the thylakoids are going to make some ATP, or they're going to phosphorylate ADP. That's what phosphorylation means. ADP is getting a phosphate group attached. Since technically the flow of electrons and the movement of protons into the thylakoid leading to ATP being produced, since light starts this process, light means photo, or photo means light. So sometimes photosynthesis is referred to as photophosphorylation. So we're going to make ATP, and we're going to use light to start this process. If you remember, in the mitochondria, that fourth step was called oxidative phosphorylation. So again, we're going to make ATP in the mitochondria, but it's not due to light. It's due to the oxidizing of these coenzymes. And that creates these flow of electrons that can ultimately be used to synthesize ATP. So 
It's called oxidative phosphorylation in respiration, but it's called photophosphorylation in photosynthesis. So again, just some terms that if they use them, I don't want you to be confused by them. Now I want to give you some additional information about the photosystems. Remember the photosystems are in the thylakoid membrane. It's labeled for you right there. And they're just a cluster of pigments. Again, photosystem 2, we talk about it first in light reaction, so it's confusing that it's named photosystem 2. But it's just simply named in the order at which it was discovered. One thing I want to point out is these photosystems contain pigments, or they're made of pigments. So let's label that these are pigments. But there's many different types of pigments. We already talked about the primary pigment is chlorophyll A, but there's also other ones like your carotenoids. That's another type of pigment. So this could be a carotenoid. There's xanthophylls. There's chlorophyll B pigment. So there's many different types of pigments, and I'm kind of indicating that down there. Primarily, though, photosystems are made of chlorophyll A, but we have these other pigments, and sometimes they're called accessory. So these are like the extras or the antenna pigments. Um, again, chlorophyll B, carotenoids, those are all examples of other types of pigments. The reason why I'm pointing this out is because I've seen many graphs and diagrams that talk about the pigments of the photosystems. And I'm showing you some information about photosystems and those pigments and how they're able to absorb light. So here we have the names of some of these different pigments. And it's basically telling you chlorophyll A is really good at absorbing red light, light that has a wavelength of about 662 nanometers. So you need to be able to understand graphs like this and be able to draw some conclusions. I've also seen lots of graphs like this on the ACT about the pigments and the absorbance of light. So let me ask you a question. It says, which wavelength of light is not absorbed by pigments in plants? So absorption, zero absorption, is down here with these different wavelengths of light. So around 600, that wavelength of light is, correlates with green light. And that explains why plants look green. So if the plant is not absorbing green, that means it's reflecting it. So it reflects green back to our eyes, and that's why plants look green. They're not absorbing that wavelength of light because the photosystems aren't made of a pigment that can absorb that wavelength of light. Now, on this next diagram, something not to have memorized, but again, I mention it so you're not confused. We can call these photosystems 2 and photosystems 1, but sometimes they're referred to as these names. So photosystem 2 can be called P680, and photosystem 1 can be called P700. The reason why they're called that is those pigments are really good at absorbing that type of wavelength of light. Again, nothing to have memorized, but sometimes we call those photosystems um, by different names. In this diagram, I wanted to talk about the splitting of water, because we know that when water split, then it's going to donate some electrons to those pigments, because the pigments are losing electrons. When the electrons get excited, they leave those pigments, and then they move down the electron transport chain. So they're going to run out electrons. Water's going to save the day. Water gets split, and so we see electrons being donated to that photosystem, and we also see that when we split water, we create these protons. And then also our leftover here is oxygen. So this is the oxygen you breathe in. It's by the splitting of water. Now, this process of the splitting of water to replace the electrons is called photo. Remember, photo means light, photolysis. So lysis means to cut, whereas photo means light. Now, I feel like you're going to envision now that light slams into water and blows it into pieces. And that's not exactly true. Water is not split by light directly, but water is split by an enzyme. That enzyme is activated by light. So this line right here is pointing to uh, this diamond shape or this rhombus. And that is the enzyme. That is the enzyme that can split the water, releasing those protons and electrons to replace those electrons being lost down the electron transport chain. Now that I've talked to you about photosynthesis, Sometimes we can get ideas of photosynthesis confused with these ideas of respiration because there's a lot of similarities. So what I want to do is I'm going to kind of draw both the chloroplasts and the mitochondria side by side so we can remember where are the protons getting concentrated so they can flow 
through ATP synthase. Well, I'm going to go ahead and draw a big plant cell to emphasize the fact that plants have both chloroplasts and mitochondria. So let's show our chloropla chloroplast here. Okay, and then we would have the cytoplasm out here. And let's draw a big mitochondria because plants do both photosynthesis and respiration. And label your mitochondria. Let's go ahead and add some grana, stacks of thylakoids. So here's the thylakoids inside of the chloroplast. Now I want to go ahead and label an ATP synthase protein. So let's draw ATP synthase. And let's put ATP synthase embedded in the inner membrane. During photosynthesis, these protons are brought into the thylakoid. So I want to emphasize that we get a really high proton concentration inside the thylakoids. Because every time those electrons are moved down the electron transport chain, these protons are brought into the thylakoid. So to make ATP, these protons are going to flow out of the thylakoid into the stroma. And they're moving through ATP synthase, and that provides the energy to make these ATP molecules. As the electrons are being passed down the electron transport chain here in the mitochondria, then that causes these protons to move out of the matrix, and they become really concentrated in this inner membrane space. Okay? So ultimately, these protons are going to flow back into the matrix through ATP synthase. So again, it's kind of looking like it's the opposite. So we concentrate protons inside the thylakoid, and then they'll flow out of the thylakoid. Over here, we're concentrating molecules not in the matrix, not in the middle of the mitochondria, but actually in this inner membrane space. So we're moving these protons out of the matrix into the inner membrane space. Again, the flow of electrons down the electron transport chain moves protons into the thylakoid, where they will flow out. But it's opposite of the mitochondria. The move of the electrons down the electron chains, electron transport chains move the protons out of the matrix into that inner membrane space. Now we talked a little bit about extra details of the light reaction, but let's look at just a few more ideas here with the Calvin cycle. Again, we say that the Calvin cycle is taking inorganic CO2. If you have a question that talks about inorganic CO2, it's probably a question referring to photosynthesis and specifically the Calvin cycle. CO2 is being incorporated into an, in, into an organic molecule. We say that when this is happening, carbon fixation occurs. That's kind of an important term to understand. When we talk about carbon fixation, we're talking about the dark reaction or the Calvin cycle. We're fixing carbon into an organic sugar. I mentioned before, you have to be able to do some math. If I ask you how many CO2s are needed to make one glucose molecule, you need to be able to tell me six. If I say we're making three glucose molecules, that's going to take 18 CO2 molecules that need to be taken in by the plant. Now, one thing I need you to know, so I'm going to move this up a little bit, is that when you see diagrams of the Calvin cycle, we can see a lot of different things coming out of the Calvin cycle right here. Now, the true molecule that the Calvin cycle produces is called G3P. And this isn't really something that you need to have memorized, but you need to know G3P is called a triose. Remember, os means sugar, and tri refers to three carbons. And you can see that triose right here, or that G3P molecule. And it's really this G3P molecule that gets made into glucose, or gets made into fructose, or other organic compounds that you can see right here. So again, let's do a little bit of math. How many G3P molecules are needed to make one molecule of glucose? The answer would be two. 
because you need six carbons, and here's one, two, three, and then you need three more, another G3P molecule. That'll give you four, five, six carbons to then form one glucose molecule. Now I want to jump back and relate again photosynthesis to free energy, which we talked about in our first lecture. And we said that during photosynthesis, light energy is being converted to chemical energy. Light energy is being stored in the bonds of those organic molecules. And that was the first law of thermodynamics. Photosynthesis takes the input of energy. So it is an endergenic reaction. It takes energy to rearrange those carbon, hydrogen, and oxygens into sugar molecules and other organic molecules. When we look at the equation for photosynthesis, ultimately what is happening to create these molecules is that we are splitting water. We're removing protons and electrons off of those water molecules and we're placing them on CO2. So we're saying that water is getting oxidized to form oxygen. And since the CO2 is accepting of those protons and electrons, we say that CO2 is reduced to form glucose. Now, you probably have seen this diagram before in your past science classes, and we just want to emphasize that these two processes are interdependent on one another. What one makes, the other one takes. So we can see here that the products of photosynthesis are the reactants for respiration. So the oxygen and the sugars go into the mitochondria because sugars, let's indicate, are unusable chemical energy. It's in the wrong form. Cells can't run off of sugar. They run off of ATP. So the mitochondria can take that sugar and break it down to generate a different form of chemical energy, such as ATP. And ATP is a usable form of energy. So again, what one makes, the other one takes. So we see the products of respiration are the reactants for photosynthesis. But one thing I want you to note is that the ATP made by the mitochondria does not go into the chloroplast. The chloroplast, the light reaction, doesn't start with energy from ATP. It starts with energy from light. So make sure if you ever have to diagram the exchange of products and reactants, um, between the chloroplast and the mitochondria, don't show the ATP going into the chloroplast. The ATP is there now in the cytoplasm for the cells to use. Now, oftentimes when we're talking about plants, they're going to use a kind of a complicated term for them. Plants are called photoautotrophs. You've probably heard of the autotroph part in a past biology class. Because auto means that they can make organic molecules themselves, okay? But to make it more technical, they can make organic molecules using carbon from inorganic CO2. So that auto and autotrophs means they can make organic molecules from CO2. The photo means that they're going to use light energy to make this process occur. Now, there's some other types of autotrophs. So again, autotrophs mean that they can make their own food or they can make their own organic molecules. Um, but these are called chemoautotrophs. And I want you to think of like bacteria that live all the way down like on the bottom of the ocean floor. We're not going to get light down there. So they need to make their own food but they're not going to use light energy for this process. So again, the auto means that they obtain carbon from inorganic CO2 that would be like in the water at the bottom of the ocean. But the chemo means that they're going to get the energy not from light, but from oxidizing chemicals. So they can use energy from chemicals um, like hydrogen sulfide. And again, you don't have to have those memorized, um, but they can use energy from those chemicals to produce their sugars. And so if you ever see anything that kind of resembles this, you can tell that there's inorganic CO2. You can tell that these organisms are making organic molecules. But 
you notice there's no light in the equation, you're talking about these bacteria that are autotrophs, but they're found in an area that does not receive light. And they're the beginning of the food chain. They're the producers of the food chain in that habitat. Now I want to take a look at data that's related to photosynthesis and respiration and see if you can answer questions about this data. When we take a look at this table here, we can see that we have plants. And it looks like over seven days, their mass increases. You need to be able to explain why. So basically, the plants are doing photosynthesis. They're taking in CO2 and turning it into glucose and storing those molecules. And they're taking in more CO2 than what they're producing due to respiration. Or another thing that we could say is the rate of CO2 intake and glucose production was greater than the rate of glucose being broken down and released as CO2 in that formation of ATP. Let's explain the second table. Why did mass decrease? Well, mass of a plant's going to decrease if you place them in the dark. Then they're no longer doing photosynthesis and making and storing organic molecules. What they're doing is they're living off their stored supply of organic molecules. Through respiration, they're breaking down those molecules, and this is a big deal, releasing CO2, and that's what's causing their mass to decrease. So if we see that an organism is using more energy than what it's intaking, so what we mean by that, if the rate of respiration, so that's the using of the glucose to make ATP, if that is greater than photosynthesis building those organic molecules, then eventually the plant's going to lose mass. And if this continues for an extended period of time, then eventually the plant's going to die. So this is like you losing too much mass over time and not taking in enough food. If more free energy is gained than is actually used. So if our use of energy, so if respiration is using up the glucose, at a lower amount than what photosynthesis is creating, then we're going to have an increase in mass. So as organisms store energy as glucose and other organic molecules, if they're not using those immediately to break down and make ATP, then the mass of the organism is going to increase. And then the last thing I want to talk about is some of these little misconceptions that I've kind of mentioned along the way. One misconception about photosynthesis is students think that the light reaction happens in the day and the dark reaction happens at night. Well, this isn't correct. The light reaction and the dark reaction of the Calvin cycle, they both occur during the day. Another misconception is that students will think photosynthesis happens during the day and then respiration happens at night. Well, here's the truth. Respiration happens 24-7 because cells are always having to break down glucose to make a constant supply of ATP to use for energy every day. Remember I said you make and use about eight, enough ATP to equal your body weight. Well, the same with plants is they need a constant supply of ATP. So they're doing respiration 24-7. Hopefully you can take a look at a diagram like this and you can understand 24-7 respiration is taking place, but if you know... We have zero photosynthesis here and zero photosynthesis here. I hope you can recognize that during this time, during this time, this is daytime. Now that we have light, we see this increase in the rate of photosynthesis. We can tell that it's starting to get a little bit dark. So the evening is starting to set in and the light is becoming less and less intense during these last hours. And eventually when it's totally dark, then we know that um, photosynthesis has stopped. Last but not least is again kind of some more application problems. Here's some examples of graphs you're going to be shown. If you see the amount of CO2, which you see here, and oxygen levels, so DO means dissolved oxygen. If you see that the problem is talking about CO2 and oxygen, then this question really just boils down to can you identify that we have photosynthesis and respiration happening at different rates during different times of the day? So it says the graph above shows the levels of CO2 in the lake over time. Explain the shape of a graph. I went ahead and kind of wrote out a model answer here. Note, if CO2 concentration is increasing, remember respiration makes CO2. So 
as animals that are living in a lake are doing respiration, they're going to produce CO2 and they're going to let that out in the water. So the levels of CO2 in the water are going to increase. So if we see CO2 going up, then that means that it's due to the respiration by the plants and the animals that are in the water. But there's another thing to note is that it must be night time. Because if it was daytime, then the plants would be taking the CO2 out of the water. And the CO2 levels wouldn't be increasing if the plants are doing photosynthesis. But during the day, we see CO2 concentration is decreasing because the plants are using that inorganic CO2 from the water when they're doing photosynthesis. And during the day, during the day, they're doing both. Plants are doing both photosynthesis and respiration but we see that they have a greater rate of photosynthesis during the day. And so that's why we're going to see CO2 levels drop during the day, even though all during the day respiration is still occurring to produce the CO2 um, that would be released in the water. Let's take a look at this other graph over here. And kind of reading through our labels here, I know it's not the best graph, but we've got dissolved oxygen in the water of a lake. And also kind of note up here, clear versus overcast. So we basically have bright and sunny versus cloudy. Explain the shape of the graph or the graphs. Hopefully you can tell that between this time, between 6 and 14 hours, we see that oxygen levels are going up. So that must mean it's daytime. The plants are doing photosynthesis, and they're producing more oxygen than what is actually being consumed by all the organisms doing respiration. We can tell that after 14 hours that our oxygen levels are dropping. That means photosynthesis has stopped, but that oxygen that's been produced all day long is being used by the plants and animals for respiration because your respiration takes the oxygen to make the ATP. So be prepared and do lots of practices where you have to look at graphs and analyze the amount of oxygen CO2 that's in the environment because that's going to relate to the organisms and whether they're performing photosynthesis or respiration.